it's kind of just like a non-entity, the filling. It's just made of sugar, and I, I can do better than that. So, Well, that's a little harsh. Hi, Internet. My name is Ariel. I'm a food scientist and plant breeder by training, and welcome to another episode of Reclaiming Chocolates and Confections, a series where I attempt to make artisanal versions of mass-produced sweets and examine the confectionery science and techniques behind each one. In this episode, we'll be examining Cadbury cream eggs, paying particular attention to the filling inside a Cadbury cream egg, which looks like a simple mixture of powdered sugar and milk, but it's so much more than that. The creamy, sometimes gritty, tooth-achingly sweet filling inside a Cadbury cream egg is called confectionery fondant, not to be confused with rolled fondant, which is used to decorate cakes. Confectionery fondant is a partially crystalline confection consisting of many microscopic sugar crystals suspended in a saturated sugar solution. It's a relatively simple confection in terms of ingredients. The most basic recipe uses just sucrose, that's table sugar, glucose syrup, and water. But the process of making fondant is, I would argue, quite complex. One of the defining characteristics of properly made fondant is its creamy smooth mouthfeel. And to achieve this velvety mouthfeel, we need to control the size of the sugar crystals in the fondant. The crystals need to be small enough such that our tongue can't detect them, which means we need them to be about 20 micrometers or less in diameter. A confection that you may be more familiar with, where controlling crystal size is imperative for achieving proper mouthfeel, is fudge. In fact, fudge is simply fondant with the addition of fat, flavoring, and dairy. So the general procedure for making fondant is as follows. Heat sucrose, glucose syrup, and water to the desired temperature, pour the syrup onto a stone slab, and allow it to cool to approximately 120 degrees Fahrenheit undisturbed. Once cooled, continuously agitate the syrup until it crystallizes completely into a short textured mass. The last two steps are crucial to ensuring proper texture and mouthfeel in the final product. And let's examine why this is. All crystalline sugar confections are based on the concept of creating a super saturated sugar solution, then promoting crystallization of that solution. And we as the confectioner can actually control what this crystallization looks like by controlling how the solution cools. Controlling crystallization allows us to control the texture and sensory properties of the end product. To understand what a supersaturated solution is and how to create one, we need to first understand what a saturated solution is. So sugar readily dissolves in water, but for a fixed volume of water at a given temperature, we can only dissolve a certain amount of sugar. For example, when using water that's at room temperature, I'm defining room temperature as 23 degrees Celsius, 73 degrees Fahrenheit, we can at most create a 67% sucrose solution. If I try adding more sugar to the water, the sugar will not dissolve and will simply settle out of solution. When the water holds as much sugar as will dissolve at a given temperature, it is called a saturated solution. If we want to dissolve more sugar into the water and create a more concentrated sucrose solution, we need to heat the water to a higher temperature. In other words, we need to increase the saturation point. If we want to create an 80% sucrose solution, for example, we need to increase the temperature of the water to 85 degrees Celsius, 185 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so let's say we've created our 80% sucrose solution. The moment the solution cools below 85 degrees Celsius, it becomes a super saturated solution. In other words, the solution holds more sucrose than could have been dissolved at the current temperature. Supersaturated solutions are unstable systems, and the more supersaturated a solution is, the more unstable it is. Sucrose molecules are attracted to one another, and with so many of them in such a relatively small volume of water, the excess sucrose molecules are likely to join together and precipitate out of solution. In other words, the excess sugar crystallizes, and again, we as the confectioner can control what this crystallization looks like. Specifically, we can control the size and the number of crystals that form. Crystallization involves two processes, crystal formation, also known as nucleation, and crystal growth. Once a solution has become supersaturated, there's a driving force for the sucrose molecules to come together to form crystal nuclei. And once a crystal nucleus forms, it serves as a site upon which additional sucrose molecules are deposited as the crystal grows. The crystal continues to grow so long as it's surrounded by a supersaturated solution. Nucleation can be catalyzed by a number of things, including agitation, impurities in the sugar, and uneven cooling of the solution. 
In most confectionery applications, some sort of particle or surface catalyzes nucleation. Nucleation and growth are two competing processes. In our case, they're competing for the excess sucrose molecules dissolved in the water. When making rock candy, we want the dominating process to be crystal growth, since the goal is to create large sugar crystals. This means that we only want a few nuclei to form in the supersaturated solution, and we want the remaining excess sucrose molecules to be distributed among these few nuclei. And we achieve this by allowing the solution to cool slowly, undisturbed. Since the solution is cooling slowly, the initial level of supersaturation is low, and nucleation is less likely to occur. We promote nucleation by inserting a rough foreign material into the solution, such as a stick or string, and once a few stable nuclei have formed on the foreign material, they begin to grow. When making fondant or fudge, on the other hand, we want nucleation to be the dominating process, since the goal is to create small sugar crystals. This means we want many nuclei to form simultaneously, and then we want the remaining excess sucrose molecules to be distributed among these many nuclei. We achieve this by allowing the solution to cool to approximately 49 degrees Celsius, 120 Fahrenheit, undisturbed, and this creates a highly supersaturated sugar solution. Once the solution cools to the target temperature, we agitate the solution continuously, generating a large number of nuclei, and the remaining excess sucrose molecules spread among the many seed nuclei, binding to any one of them, which keeps the size of the resulting crystals small, and this is what creates the rich, velvety, melt-in-the-mouth texture characteristic of fondant and fudge. Okay, so now that you understand the confectionery science behind fondant, let's move on to making artisanal Cadbury cream eggs. The fondant formulation I'm using is from this book, Chocolates and Confections by Peter P. Grueling. The ingredient amounts are listed below in the description box. Cadbury cream eggs are an example of a shell molded confection where the chocolate shell is produced first and is then filled. Regardless of what material the mold is made from, the technique is essentially the same. You fill the prepared molds completely with tempered chocolate, vibrate, allow the chocolate to set for a few minutes, then invert the molds to remove the excess chocolate, leaving only a thin lining of chocolate in the mold. This shell of chocolate becomes the outside of the confection. In this video, I'm using real eggshells as my molds, though if you plan on making artisan Cadbury cream eggs regularly, I highly recommend investing in a polycarbonate mold. Caveats for using real eggshells are listed in the description box. Each artisan egg will have a chocolate shell made from approximately 33 grams of dark chocolate and a filling consisting of approximately 43 grams of fondant, 11 grams of which will be yellow fondant, and 32 grams of which will be white fondant. Okay, so the first thing you need to do is prepare your molds. Bore out a half inch diameter opening at the bottom of each eggshell, empty the contents, and rinse each eggshell thoroughly with tepid soapy water. Steam the shells for 20 minutes, then evaporate any residual water in the shells by placing them in an oven set to the lowest possible temperature. Once they've fully dried, remove them from the oven and allow them to cool to room temperature. The next thing you need to do is prepare the work surface that you plan on pouring your hot fondant syrup onto. The work surface needs to allow even cooling of the solution and also provide enough room for you to agitate the solution later down the road. The best work surface is a large, thick stone slab, which will cool the fondant syrup quickly and evenly, preventing premature crystallization as the syrup cools. Prepare your work surface by lightly spritzing the surface with cold water. Next, combine the sugar, glucose syrup, and water in a pot, and heat the mixture to a temperature of 117 degrees Celsius, 243 degrees Fahrenheit, over medium-high heat. As the syrup comes to a boil, stir the mixture to ensure that the sugar crystals dissolve quickly and completely. Any undissolved sugar crystals will act as seeds or nuclei that promote crystallization of the solution, which is something that we don't want to occur at this point. When the solution begins to boil, stop stirring. Any form of agitation at this point can cause the mixture to crystallize. And if you see any sugar residue on the sides of the pot, use a wet pastry brush to dissolve them away. Repeat this as often as necessary to keep the sides of the pot clean. Once the sugar solution reaches 117 degrees Celsius, 243 degrees Fahrenheit, remove the mixture from the heat and pour the hot solution onto a stone slab that has been lightly spritzed with cold water. Lightly spritz cold water on top of the syrup and allow the syrup to cool to 49 degrees Celsius, 120 degrees Fahrenheit, undisturbed. Once the solution has cooled, use a scraper to continuously agitate the solution, folding the mass onto itself and spreading it across the stone slab until the fondant crystallizes completely, becoming a short textured mass. There are a few things to keep in mind here. 
Once you begin the agitation process, agitation should be constant in order to create the proper smooth texture. Intermittent agitation creates fewer larger crystals, leading to a grainy texture. You don't need to agitate the solution aggressively, just constantly. Grueling states that it takes approximately 20 minutes of constant agitation. This was my first time making fondant and it took me approximately one hour. I recommend wearing gloves and keeping your scraper as clean as possible during the process. Don't make the same mistake I made of dropping my scraper into the puddle of syrup. If you don't intend on using the fondant immediately, store the fondant in an airtight container. You'll notice that this fondant recipe creates a significantly harder fondant than the one found in a Cadbury cream egg. To soften the fondant, we're going to use something called Invertase. Invertase is an enzyme that breaks down, or inverts, one molecule of sucrose into one molecule of fructose and one molecule of glucose, using up a water molecule from the solution in the process. As more and more sucrose molecules are broken down by the invertase, the fondant becomes more fluid in nature. Since one molecule of water is required to invert one molecule of sucrose, there needs to be enough water available for the enzyme to be active, which means that there is a maximum level of softening that can occur for each fondant formulation. Invertase is widely used in the confectionery world to soften fondants. And what makes it really useful is that you can create a super hard fondant that has invertase in the formulation. And while the fondant is still hard, you can cover it in chocolate by either enrobing it or panning it. And over time, the invertase decreases the viscosity of the fondant, leaving a softer center within the chocolate coating. To incorporate invertase into the fondant, warm 645 grams of fondant to approximately 66 degrees Celsius, 151 degrees Fahrenheit, then add 0.25 teaspoons of invertase and stir to fully incorporate. Store the invertase treated fondant at room temperature and after approximately five days, this should be the texture of the fondant. Notice how it's considerably softer than the original texture and is now pipeable. While the fondant undergoes softening, you can create the chocolate shells. Temper the dark chocolate using whatever method you'd like. Refer to my Three Musketeers video, link in the description, for instructions on one tempering method. Once you've tempered your chocolate, keep it at a working temperature of 32 degrees Celsius, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, using whatever method you'd like. I use an immersion circulator set at 32 degrees Celsius, 90 degrees Fahrenheit. When working with multiple individual molds rather than a single polycarbonate mold, we work in small batches to give us greater control over shell thickness. Note that the longer a mold sits filled with chocolate, the thicker the resulting shell will be. I recommend working with four molds at a time. Start by warming four molds to approximately 30 degrees Celsius, 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Warming the molds helps to prevent the chocolate from setting too quickly and unevenly when the molds are filled. Do not warm the molds above 32 degrees Celsius, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, as this will likely take the chocolate out of temper. Transfer a portion of tempered chocolate to a piping bag and fill the four shells completely with tempered chocolate. Vibrate to remove air bubbles and allow the chocolate to sit in the filled molds for a few minutes. I can't tell you exactly how long to leave the chocolate in the molds because it depends on a number of factors, including ambient temperature, viscosity of the chocolate, and size and shape of the molds. You'll need to perform some trial and error, but I recommend starting with a setting period of two minutes and adjusting accordingly. Working in the same order in which they were filled, invert the shells one at a time over a bowl and shake to remove all excess chocolate, leaving only a thin lining of chocolate in the shell. Since the opening of the shell is relatively small, you may need to tap the shell with some force to remove all excess chocolate. Set the lined shells upside down and allow the chocolate to set for a few minutes. When the chocolate reaches a plastic state, scrape the opening of the molds to clean off excess chocolate before repeating the shelling process one more time if needed. Remember that we want a shell made from approximately 33 grams of chocolate. I do not recommend shelling a given mold more than twice. Once you've shelled all your molds, allow the shells to set for 24 hours undisturbed. When you're ready to fill your chocolate shells, color 165 grams of the Invertase treated fondant to the desired egg yolk color using yellow and red food coloring. Transfer the yellow and white fondant into separate piping bags. Fill each shell with approximately 32 grams of white fondant, then 11 grams of yellow fondant, making sure to leave enough headspace to cap the shell with chocolate. To cap the shells, use a hair dryer or heat gun to slightly soften the edges of the shell's opening, then fill each opening with tempered chocolate. 
Heating the edges before capping with chocolate helps the chocolate cap bond to each chocolate shell, ensuring a strong seal. This is what happens if you don't heat the edges of the chocolate shell before capping. Allow the chocolate to completely set before carefully unmolding each egg. Okay, so there you have it, artisanal Cadbury cream eggs. And I really wanna demonstrate the texture of the fondant, so please enjoy the following footage. So there is a lot of information in this video. I hope it'll serve as a useful resource for confectionery enthusiasts or anyone who's interested in making this at home. I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope you learned something new. And if you did, please like and subscribe. Anyway, if you have any questions, feel free to send them my way. You can either leave a comment below or contact me through Instagram. Okay, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video.